that sometimes with our auditors, the time we spend, sometimes it's a sleepless night. So for the directors, I think it's a sleepless night uh, whenever they think of this seance. And that is why sometimes you, you would have seen some companies, they, they, they restrict themselves, they don't want to go for a share issue. They are scared, thinking that the shares may not get subscribed. Hmm? And because, because if you don't get subscribed, uh, you know, uh, it's not good for you, it's, it's, your, it's a reputation and damage for you. The, the whole media will talk about saying that such and such company came out with a share issue and it failed. And that will be a reflection on the board of directors. That will be a reflection particularly on the finance director's ability to understand the right price. So getting the right price is a not a very easy thing, right? So uh, here what they have done is, so now they have almost decided, I think, to go for a share issue. Probably you recommended in your first part and now, now they have decided, yes, we are going to go ahead with it. So remember the first section. Hmm? Is this generally how the tasks will, will go? The sort of first one, then the second one? Yeah, right. Yeah, you can see, you can see some connection. Now, I was just, that, I was just about to tell you. You remember the first meeting was on the 15th of May. 15th of May. Yeah. And now we can see on the 22nd of May, uh, at 9.25 in the morning, she's writing to you. Hmm? Yeah. So that's, okay. the, that's the reality. But uh, now I must give you a warning. Maybe in your first area, you have not recommended the CI show. Now you might feel, oh my gosh, uh, what will happen to the second scenario? Don't worry about it. Right? If there is no right answer, there is no wrong, wrong answer. You can, you may not recommend it, but they may, they may decide it. Not that every time when you, not that every time when you recommend they will go ahead, not that every time when you don't recommend they don't go ahead. Right? But that is, yeah. that is what the diversity means in a board of directors. I have seen many a times when I, uh, when I say no, they, these people go ahead with it. Sometimes when I say yes, they don't go ahead with it. But that is not a reflection of my inability. I have given my uh, independent opinion. I have given my uh, professional opinion. It is up for them to accept it or not. Sometimes I, I, it has proved that what I said was right. Sometimes it is proved that what I said was not right. That's a different story. So what I'm trying to tell you is, if you find the second task, uh, something like a question like that, don't get worried what you did in the first part. As long as you justify what you, you did. You justify, yeah, yeah, because, because in a board that you know there is nothing called right and wrong. 20 people getting together, there will be 20 different ways. But ultimately they will come to a consensus. So, yes, yes. You may be you may be the one odd man out. I have fought many cases in the company, in the board of directors, uh, being the one odd man out. One odd man out. Very tough. Not a, not easy. Not an easy proposition. But that is what we are supposed to do it, right? And yeah. and that can happen. So here uh, they paid a consulting firm a lot of money and spent an afternoon learning about the company valuation. So the board of directors. Uh, you know, they would have got a consulting firm and uh, through the consulting firm they have learned about company valuation. Yeah. So now this is a dangerous thing sometimes you and I realize in company. When they go for li these little, little consultations and when they go and learn little, little things, they think, oh my God, they know everything. And that puts yeah. you as the finance director, finance manager in a spot. Because because, because these fellows, the non-financial fellows, they go for this uh, finance from the non-finance fellows one day seminar and they think that you know they know much more than you and me who have completed the SEMA exams after going through all these painful process. Yeah, yeah. So, so you have to be mindful of these fellows, apply a lot of pressure on you, telling you, hey, and do I know what, you know, this is not the way to do this, that and the other, but you must be strong enough to put your professional competence up front. I have, I have, I have seen this in my own life many a time. Uh, depreciation. Some people, they talk about depreciation in terms of, you know, if you do, if you maintain, now one, one chairman of a company told me, look here, I buy a car and I maintain the car so well, right? So, so the, there is no value depreciation. There is no value coming down. So why should I provide depreciation for that car? <laughs> hmm. 
and and uh, the argument was not with me because it was a, it was a, it was a big forum you know uh, the because uh, the question was if i provide depreciation the uh, the, the accounts are going to show a loss and that means all the employees are not going to get a bonus right so it was in the in, in front of the prime minister of the country so uh, i'm the <laughs> i'm the poor accountant now i have provided depreciation and it is showing loss and but my chairman is arguing against me and saying look here if i buy a car and if i maintain it so well why should i provide depreciation and the prime minister is looking at, uh, and the prime minister is looking at me and telling you answer kuma why it is not so now unless i give the account is that because depreciation is not a question of the uh, uh, reduction in the value of asset depreciation is for the use of the asset but is for the wear and tear Yeah, yeah. So that is why we provide depreciation. So if I did not know that answer, I would have been in a real crisis. All the top people, the trade union, everyone was there. So since I knew that, when I said, sir, the depreciation is not about the value of reduction of asset. In fact, most of the assets must be depreciated. In fact, it has got depreciated. It is not what matter. It is for the use of the asset, the wear and tear we are providing in the financial statement. The prime minister saw it. And the chairman said, "Oh, now only I realize." Right. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, so you must be professionally competent. In a scenario, you might find all the fellows against you, but you have to stand firm. Yeah. So, yeah. so they have gone to a consulting firm and they have spent a, a afternoon, so half a day session probably. None of the stuff that was covered was new to me, but it got me out of my office for a while. so you can see the ceo stand right she knew she was she you got nothing new to her whatever the stand whatever the account the valuations they are used but she said even she uh, for a moment it was out of office for her in the sense that there was some some confusion for her i need you to prepare a note for me about the suitability of each of these four main valuation methods for our purposes now you can see the task coming up beautifully and nicely it is uh, you have to prepare a note about the suitability of each of these four main valuation i have to think about it too and so i will be able to check my own opinion against you so she also knows this uh, so you can understand now her mentality when you are writing to her uh, you can assume that she knows some things about me so you don't need to write from a to z but you will give your views she will also put her views and the manager has to prepare a report to the board of directors right yeah and also some of the boards are starting to get a bit worried about all of this naturally right because uh, not all everyone is very comfortable with going public uh, that is one of the one of the the, the uh, most cruel decisions i would say a company could take uh, for the director go in public because you are exposing you have to do everything transparent you lose your freedom and there so many things so they realize there are some governance issues arising from the initial pricing that uh, but they have very little idea of what they are governance issues governance issues so what they are going to be right could you have a think about that as well and put your thoughts in writing If we both think about it separately, then we will come up with more that I could work in on my own. So now you have to understand what is your role here. Right, your role is to support the CEO. It is the yeah. CEO who is going to write the the final report. So it's basically what you are going to do is you are going to do some a kind of a memo or something to the CEO. So you are not writing to the board of directors because the CEO will take your matters. They will take his matters. And put everything, and he will write the report, or she. Right? Yeah, yeah. She is going to write the report. So, so, uh, so you have to be careful. You should not be writing to the board of directors in this case. You should be writing to the CEO, giving your ideas about what she is asking about. So, uh, okay. very, yeah, yeah, very important that you really understand uh, what you are going to really look at. Yeah. So, so, uh, just give me a second. Uh, Okay. Give me a second, uh, Andrew. No problem. No yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. 
Right. So, so basically that is what. So, I'm, and then finally she says the nasty thing. I'm sorry, but I no need all this very urgent thing. So you know the urgency. It is. It, you have only one hour to write everything yeah. and to tell. There are two issues that you are going to enter. One about. So the the referral that is given for this paper is uh, is the very valuation report given by this uh, company. Right. So yeah. this is this is the this is the this is the valuation model, a presentation by valuing consultants or some people, right? So uh, they are basically yeah. they are they are they are the people with a considerable experience in the valuation of business. Now that can uh, that can uh, put you off thinking, oh my God, how to challenge their report, right? Because they are the people who have in so much of experience. But that does not mean anything for us. We are we are also professionals, so we know. Right, we don't need to care too much about their knowledge. We know our knowledge. We can advise clients on the application of principal valuation model in order to determine an appropriate asking price for the sale or placing of a company. So probably I think uh, probably I think what they are given is a is a kind of a PowerPoint presentation. So that is the approach. And the third one, uh, the, the basis. Asset-based valuation: the value of an entity is equal to the net assets attributable to the equity shares. Intermediate assets are only included if they have a realizable value. So they are talking about one basis of valuation. Then they are talking about the second basis of valuations: earnings-based. Assume that the value of an entity is equal to the present value of the future earnings that will generate by the business. This method is based on two elements: the price earnings and the post-tax earnings per share. Which, when combined, gives the market price per share. Mm -hmm. Then the third one, the dividend-based valuation. Assume that the annual dividend payable of entity will go at a constant rate. Equation for obtaining, you remember, the valuation is equal to d naught times one plus g k minus g. So these are some other things you will probably brush up on your F three area. Right. Yeah. Then the finally, the cash-based valuation. Assume that the value of an entity is equal to the present value of future cash flows generated by the business. So this is the report that they have given. So and now again I go back to see what my the, my CEO is asking from me. So I see what my CEO is asking is I need you to prepare a note about the suitability of each of these four main valuation methods for our purposes. Now my key word is for our purposes. Our purposes. What is our purpose? You remember. We are a private company. We have been there a long, outstanding private company, doing very successfully, wanting to go for a public listing. So that is our purpose. Why we want to go for a public listing is because some other shareholders have already requested, and I think there is a good case for us to go for public listing. Only one man seems to be somewhat uh, in a bit of a dilemma. We will have, we have, we have a good tackle him. Right. Yeah. So now this is your scenario. So now you have to just before you even think of writing, you will probably plan about it. Yeah. You will probably plan about it. You have to think for a moment. Uh, what are the factors that I am going to talk about? I have to talk about these four valuation methods. Right. That is one thing I need to say. I have. So I need you to prepare a note for me about the suitability of each of these four valuation methods. That is one thing I need to do. I'll have to, I'll have to think about it too, so I'll be able to. So you don't need to do anything more than just to talk about the four kinds of valuation and to say the suitability. Whether what is this suitable? This is suitable. If not, why this, that, and the other? Then the second scenario we have is about the governance issue arising about the initial pricing, right? Because uh, because uh, they know that the directors have a concern that there is some governance issue, but they have a very little idea. Now there you can see you have to give a fairly a detailed one mm -hmm. because they don't have to do any calculations or anything. Pardon? You, Pardon? You wouldn't need to do any calculations or anything. No, not necessary. Most of these special societies there will not be any calculations. Right? Yeah, yeah. Could you have a, could you have, have a think about it that as well and put your thoughts in writing? So it's about the yeah. governance issues, you know, the the share price when it comes out, when it comes up high, what is going to happen? When it comes up low, what can happen? And all that kind of a thing. 
right? So, so yeah. that's basically that's basically the issue. So now we have to think about uh, about how we are going to approach it. So the first thing that I'm going to look at is I have to write to Judy, right? So it is a basically a you know she has not asked you a memo or anything like that. She has just said put up your thoughts in writing. So I can just I can just take a very casual uh, day and I can just put a note to him, note to her. Okay. So I can just say dear Judy or hi Judy or something like that, right? Because in the Western okay, yeah. in the in the Western world scenario, we can just put up our first name and just put up hi Judy. Uh, this refers to the discussion that we have had, and uh, and. Uh, 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 we can, you know, we can get another extra one mark if you say, I trust that you have already uh, successfully handled the, the matter about RNL. Hmm? Okay. That will, that will, that will, that will give that liveness to the thing. Because, you know, last week she was asking about the RNL and the other thing. So you say, I trust that you have handled the RNL's matter well. And now, since you have decided or since you have uh, w working on the going for quotation, these are my views about the four pricing methods suggested by this uh, well consultants over. Right, okay, yeah. Now that is uh, real life, real life. That is really what you will do it. Right? If, yeah. the, if the report was given, you are not going to be silent about the report. You are going to say about the report and also about the last week's discussion. You know, I'm not going to forget about it. Right, because I get some contribution about my my uh, to my CEO. So I want to say that I hope that uh, you have been very successful on uh, uh, the tunnels mission. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So now we have to we have to talk about uh, we have to talk about uh, what are we going to do? It. Hmm? Well, how are we going? How are we going to work it out? So we have to we we can take each of these as as a basis valuations and talk about. It and see the appropriateness or the suitability. So the first one is the asset-based valuation. So we must talk little bit about asset-based valuation much more than what our consultant has told. Yeah, yeah. So, so you remember what the consultant said. The consultant basically said it is, uh, it is uh, what he said was, um, what, what did he say? So I can just refer it up and quickly see what the consultant and about the asset basis valuation. So she he gave us just a little presentation using that the value of an entity is equal to the net assets attributable to the equity shareholder. So uh, intangible assets are only included if it is so. So we have to talk about the net assets. What is meant by net assets? Because your directors would have seen this uh, slide. So now they must be wondering what is this net asset. Not only the directors, sometimes even we don't know what the net assets are. What are the net assets of a company? Yeah? yeah. What are the net assets of the company? So the net assets are basically your total assets minus total liabilities. Yeah. yeah. You, you have to deduct from your assets, your borrowings, to arrive at what we call the net assets. Net assets. And that net assets, when you divide it by the number of shares, it gives the asset basis valuation. So you must talk about whether this is appropriate for our company. What do you think? When is the asset basis valuation most appropriate? Hmm? When is the asset based valuation most appropriate? Any ideas? Asset. Yeah, asset base is actually not appropriate, you can note it down, not appropriate for a going concern. Hmm? A continuing business, asset basis is not the right approach, uh, um, Andrew. Asset basis is good if you are going for liquidation, if you are shutting down the company, you will try to realize the value of the asset. But in a going concern, in a business that is going to continue, what we are interested in the future earnings and not the assets that we have. We are using the asset to make earnings. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? So, so one in our 
three was my my weakest. Okay, right, right, you're right, right. So I will send you a little bit of a note on this valuation method. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I'll send you a little bit of a note on the valuation methods for you to get a good idea. So let me tell you the valuation method. The asset base is basically what you look at is the assets of the company. Now the assets are the assets that is appearing in the statement of financial position. What are the assets appearing in the statement of financial position? They are the property, plant and equipment, the inventory, the, the receivables and the cash. And from that, when you deduct your liabilities, you get the net value of assets and that is what we call the net asset. And that is the that is the asset that is owned by the director, the, the shareholders. Because after paying all the liabilities, whatever that is it. But the, in a company, the assets are used to earn for the future. So a company that is going to continue in business, asset valuation is not the most appropriate. So that is what you are going to say. That is what, yeah. that is what you are going to say. And because the real the problem is asset valuation can get distorted by many things. One thing, because it is based on your accounting valuation method. So you may have provided depreciation, but still it may have a market value. Hmm? Yeah. So because of that asset valuation may not reflect the true value of the company. And then there is something what we call an intangible asset. The assets that is not reflected in the balance chain. Yes, yes. But it is useful. Now in this company, there has been a long outstanding company. So surely they have uh, what we call a reputation. Hmm? Yes. Reputation. So they have a good customer network who are patronizing them. Now those assets are not reflected in the in the valuation of in the statement of financial position. The director's experience, that is not reflected in the financial statement. So because of that, there are what we call intangible assets. Lot of lot of intangible assets are there in a business. Right? So uh, the, the, the database of the customers, right? The brand recognition, lot of there are lot of brands. You remember the cast name, right? They have been in business for a long period. A family business that have grown and which is suitable to be listed in the first 250 listed companies. Yeah? So they are a big company. So when you look at from that angle, you can see um, the, the, they have many other assets which are not reflected in the, in the balance sheet. And therefore, the, for a particular, for a, a going concern company, asset valuation is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And some of the deficiencies on the asset valuation can be corrected. Instead of taking the book values, you can substitute with replacement value. But finding the replacement value for each of the assets is not really practical. And valuation of the intangible assets, even though there are a couple of methods, you remember in your F3, calculated intangible value assets, uh, book to market value to book, uh, replacement value to book. I will send you a little bit of a note on these areas for you to read it, but you will see in all those cases. Uh, and because the, the shareholders invest money in a company, not based on the assets, but based on your future earnings. So to that extent, the valuation method of asset basis is not suitable for our company. Not suitable for our company. It may be suitable for another company which is going for bankruptcy, liquidation. Yeah. Okay. Then we must talk about the next valuation, the earnings-based valuations. So earnings-based is basically you are trying to work, you are trying to uh, work out your future earnings, future earnings, right? So that is what. So the, our company Cast is a very profitable company, right? The, the profitable company and you remember the company had changed its structure now very much because earlier they were more on the departmental stores concept but now they are changed it and they are gone into online and many other things so uh, so uh, because of that the historical profits may not reflect the future profits that we are going to earn future profits may be much much more larger than what we are earning today right this is what you are going to talk about right 
and even at yeah. present they are earning good profits because you can see in the pay say they are making good profits and having a healthy cash surplus so when you really look at from that one um, there is a good case to argue that we must go for forecasted earnings and with the forecasted earnings you remember something called price earnings ratio yeah yeah what is the price earnings ratio price earnings ratio is price divided by earnings yeah that is what the price earnings ratio is price divided by earnings so price divided by earnings is what we call p ratio so yeah, uh, yeah. so only the uh, p ratios are available only for listed company because only the listed company will have a market price per share so maybe the market price per share is 20 in a listed company and the earnings per share is and we say 4 then we say the price earnings ratio is 5 that is what the price said mm -hmm. so i just want to divert from a little bit from the question for you because i know that your p uh, f3 is not the strongest what does this mean for you it, when the when a company says our p ratio is 5 so remember p ratios are available only for a listed company why because for a unlisted company there is no p ratio why because there is no market price for the share yeah. market price for the share so a company that has a market price of shares of 20 for example in this case and which is going to earn a, a earnings per share of 4 that means for a year it is earning 4 dollars per you now what do you like this i want to ask you a question like this right who fixes the market price of the share who fixes the market price of the share so in your company if it is a listed company who fixes the market price of the share Yeah, market fix it. Yeah, yeah, right. Not the directors, right? Not the employees, not the government. The market fix. The market is the people who are going to buy the share and who are going to sell the shares, right? So, yeah. so they have fixed the price of twenty, and you are earning at at as of today four dollars for a year. Four dollars for a year. So twenty divided by four is what we call five. What does it mean? what it means i want you to listen to it very carefully what it means is the investors are prepared to wait for 5 years to recover the capital is it clear yeah. right because they are prepared to pay 20 when they are earning 4 per year they are prepared to pay 20 that means they are prepared to wait for 5 years to recover the capital that is what the the, the pe ratio means P ratio is always the number of years that the investor is prepared to wait. So now, as I said, the P ratios are available only for a listed company. Now our company is not a listed company; it is an unlisted company. But we want to go for listing, so we have to decide at which price we are going to go. So from this, we can see the P, the price divided by earnings is equal to P ratio. Price is equal to PE times earnings. Yeah, yeah. Right? Price is equal to PE times earnings. Now, our company, if we want to fix a price, what we can look at is we can look at a similar company, a listed company, and we can take their PE ratio. Hmm? We can take a similar listed company, and we can take their PE ratio. So let's assume yeah. another company's PE ratio is six. Six into if our earnings per share is three, we can fix the price as eighty. Mm -hmm. That is what. Mm -hmm. So in the pre, it gives you two companies' PE ratios. Yeah. So how would you know kind of which one to use? That's a good PE? question. That's a good question. You are, you are, you can't give an exact one. You might give a range. Now, for example, I think in this question there we have two companies. Hmm? Yeah, one four point nine and one one point one. Now you can use the two ranges. You one multiplied right. by four point nine, the other one multiplied by one. So that is the range. Because right. okay. now that is what you are going to say. So the P ratio calculation is a more appropriate thing because we are our earnings are going to be somewhat different from our historical earnings because we are changing our strategy. We are into a new kind of activity. 
So because of that, it's a good thing to forecast our earnings and to multiply it by a particular P ratio and to get it. Having said that one, you will say the difficulty is whose P ratio is more appropriate for you to decide it. Hmm? To decide it. Whose P ratio? Should I take that uh, competitor number one? Should I take a competitor two, number two? Or should I take a totally another outsider? Okay, yeah. yeah. So that is a difficulty you will always have it. But if you can find, because you are not going to find the, the exact match for your company, right? You are not going to find the exact match for your company. So you have to find the almost the identical company, but not really the exact. So if you can find and get that P ratio and multiply, you may be able to get a range of price. Range of price. Range of prices that will open up your uh, brains to decide which kind of a prime fund is because you can be we can say in our discussion we will say we can see our two competitors they they have totally two different uh, scenarios yeah so because of that we can so we can we, we don't need to do any calculations but we can say we can multiply by the p ratio of uh, uh, the the one company and also by the multiply by the other company and take a range so that the directors can come to a come, come some kind of a reasonable conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and the other thing is to, to uh, your past earnings per share may not be truly relevant because your uh, strategies have changed. So you may have to go for a forecasted earnings per share. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So forecast earnings per share. So that also may be, may be something uh, uh, which is subjective, so uh, the directors may be somewhat concerned about the forecasted earnings. So these are some other things that you are going to talk about on the earnings method. Okay. But we yeah. uh, say definitely the, the net asset method is not right for us. Uh, this looks like uh, this looks like a, a kind of a thing, but provided we can find the right P, if so not can have a range and can be compared with uh, companies, but we be a successful company, we would like to compare with a successful company. Now yeah. one, one thing you have to realize is higher the P ratio, better the company it is. Now this formula shows it very clearly. The price will go up depending on your P ratio. If the P ratio is 6, it will be 6 into 3. If the P ratio is 7, it will be 7 into 3. If the P ratio is 8, it may be 8 into 3. So higher the yeah. P ratio, better that other company. So we are not we are not a company that is, you know, we should undervalue. We are a company that is doing very successful. We have changed our strategies, we have enough cash, all that, and therefore we should be looking at uh, at a uh, at a best company and we can be comparable with any one of the best companies. You know, yeah. you must be very positive. You must be very positive because you are working inside the company, and it's not it's not a it's not something a false positiveness. It is based on your facts and figures. Yeah, yeah. So that is what uh, you, you are expected. That is what we call leadership skill. There, because you you take that you assume that you know you are a big leader, and you are not going to be a very negative man thinking oh my. If I'm if I have some problems, I will be negative. But otherwise, yeah. I must be very confident. Look here, my company, we can go for it, and we should not be comparing with a uh, with a with a with a lower company. We should be comparing with the best company because we have another best. Mm -hmm. Okay. On the, on the earlier one, I forgot one thing. In this company, we have a lot of cash, two hundred or million cash in the balance sheet, in the statement of financial position. Now, when you're thinking yeah. of asset valuation, remember the cash figures also. If you have too much of cash in a public listed company, that's not a very good thing in a public listed company. Because in a public listed company, either you must invest or you must return the money to the shareholders. You are not expected to keep money idly in your bank account. But, but you can see this company, last year so they had 200 billion. This year, so they have 200 on me. Right? Why are they keeping money? Why do you think? Why are they keeping money? Any particular thing? 
Why are they keeping money? Because we can see last year so they had 200 million, this year so they had 200 odd million. The reason is this, Andrew. They, because we are a private company. You need to have funds in some but in a reserve form, in liquid form. If you get an opportunity, you can invest. Yeah. You understand? Public companies, yeah. public listed companies, no, you don't need to keep money like that. If you want money, you can raise money at any time from the market. Yeah. yeah. But uh, here, here with 40 shareholders, we can't raise money for any money. So because of that, a private company will always have some form of money. But right. okay. having said that one, uh, we should not be overplaying that too much about excess cash because when you have excess cash, you can become a good target for acquisition, right? It's like a, it's like, it's like in this Asian society, if you find a, a girl with lot of money, she will, she will become a good target for many people because the, yeah. the, the because of the dowry system and all that in this culture, they are looking for that kind of, a, she becomes a target. And the company is also the same story. If you have a lot of money, you become a, you become very attracted in the market and you become a, a, a kind of a target for a takeover. That is why most of the company don't want to have big cash balances. They, they must either invest or if they don't have any investment uh, uh, reasons, they must return the money. So, so we must not be overplaying and if even if you are going for a listing, I suppose what we will do is we will first distribute this cash and then go for a listing, right? Because we don't want to keep yeah. too much of money and get ourselves attracted or tempted kind of a thing. But, uh, but uh, this valuation it has lot of subjectivity because it is based on a P of another company and also based on forecasted earnings. Then the third method is the dividend-based valuation. Dividend-based valuation. So the valuation model is that you are getting dividends on every year on a constant basis. So here again, let me just uh, deviate from the question just to refresh your memory on, uh, on the valuations and all that kind of a thing. Yeah? So, so imagine that your uh, parents have invested some money for you somewhere and that every year you are going to get, you know, shall we say, a hundred thousand pounds, every year you are going to get it, till you yeah, live, yeah. till you live, and this is what we call an annuity. Every year you are going to get a hundred thousand, hundred thousand, hundred thousand, till you yeah, live. Yeah. So, so uh, the, the thing is, what is the present value of all this money? That is, you are going to get year one, year two, year three, year till you are, you know, 70 years, 80 years, you will be getting. So, even though you are going to get for so many years, the value of all this money is decided, 100,000, the value, annuity value, divided by the cost of interest or the rate of interest. So, the market interest rates are, shall we say, 10%, right, 10%, then the value of all that money in today's terms is 1 million. You may get 3 million, over a period of 100,000, but taking the money value of money, the, in the, the interest, so this is what we call, so in other words, if you are getting a continuous A annuity, the present value of all that is A divided by R. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So similarly, if a company is going to pay you a dividend every year, a, a dividend called D, 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 continuously, the present value of that company in form of dividend is dividend and for the dividend the return is cost of equity. Yeah, yeah. Right? But, so that is the constant dividend valuation model. Every year you are getting the same dividend and it is like the annuity. But most of the companies will not give a constant dividend. This year if they pay one dollar, they might pay you next year uh, with a 10% increase, one ten per share. Next year, with another 10% increase, they will give you 121. Next year, with another 10%, they will give you 133. So, there's a growth rate, and that growth rate in this particular case is 10%. So, if that happens, and that's a normal way the people will like to have a dividend, not same dividend every year, but a constant growth, in that case, this formula, D divided by KE, because it's not a normally a, not a one-year dividend. Now it is 
two days dividend, that is the first year's dividend, one, for example, D naught times one plus G, that is the growth, that's the growth, divided by KE minus G. This is the formula. This formula is given in your exam sheet, but I'm, I'm, I'm telling you how this formula is made up. So you can see, the, if the constant growth dividend, uh, this is what uh, this uh, man said that our, our consultant, he said this formula. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he basically said the dividend model calculation is based on uh, D naught 1 plus G divided by K minus G. Yeah, that is given, yeah. yeah. That is given in the formula and that is what she was, uh, she was, uh, she was, uh, she was talking about in the consultant's the evaluation. Yeah. So that is the right thing. That's the right thing, right? So D naught 1 plus G. So you can see this is the formula they are given and this is the, uh, what we will, uh, what we will see. So uh, D naught 1 plus G is, uh, is the formula that we have and you can see uh, if I if I really if you say no growth that means no G right if you know growth what happens what happens to this formula imagine no growth that means no G right so it's a constant dividend so then what happens then what happens is the present value becomes D naught D naught is going to be this dividend every year divided by K and that you can see yeah. it is the same formula what we did it here so that's the formula. Yeah, okay. So so you can see that's another way for you to value a company. But that valuation is also not right for our company. Because we are going to uh, sell, uh, if you are going to sell it uh, to the market, that may not be the right valuation. It is good if you are going to buy some shares, yeah, you want to earn some dividends. Hmm. If you are going to earn some dividends, it's all, all right, right? Because the, the company had been a business, a family business for a long years, right? So the dividend paid all this time, I mean the dividend all they paid all this time, is no indication of company's ability to pay dividend. When it's a private company, uh, it's not like a public company. You, the, 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 the 40 shareholders will get together and decide this year we will take a lower dividend. Yeah, yeah. Because they can, because 40 people, know, I mean almost all, some of the people are family people. So you can get together and decide, hey Arthur, do you need a dividend? Hey John, do you need a dividend? So you decide the dividend. So uh, it, so this year you pay one dollar per dividend, next year, next year you pay 50 cents per dividend. It is not going to reflect the negative effect what we call signal in effect. For a private yeah. company, there is no signal in effect because uh, the, de the decision of the director, the, the, the dividend, is more of a, a consensus de decision of all the shareholders. But in a public company, dividend decision is a decision taken by the board of directors. So it has a meaning. So it has a meaning. So that is why in a public company, uh, when you pay a dividend one year and if you reduce the dividend, it may reflect a, a kind of a negative signal in effect. Yeah? Yeah, the, the, the market will have doubts in, in the company's That's correct, it will have a kind of a, but in a private company it may not be so because the, because the shareholders are closely connected, everyone knows what's happening and they might decide this year we are not going to pay a dividend. Right. We are going to keep it. So, so because of that, uh, this, uh, this uh, basis of valuation is also not very appropriate for our company because our dividend has been somewhat maybe fluctuating and that, that is generally acceptable for a private company. Yeah. Private, okay. private company dividends are not uh, signal based dividends kind of thing. Yeah. So the dividend growth that you may have for the past year may not reflect the real growth uh, what is going to happen. Right? And, and the fact that we have enough cash in the bank account implies that we could have paid a higher dividend. Hmm? The cash, because if there were no cash it's a different story. But the fact that we have enough cash, big cash balance, implies that we, can, we could have paid a higher dividend. Yeah? Yeah. 
right so that is also not a uh, not a very very good model to be applied then the final one is what we call the cash based model cash based model right there what is basically happening is you look at the you look at the the cash flows the future cash flows right that is what we call the free operational cash flows after you prepare cash forecast for the future and then you try to discount all those cash flows and bring it to the present value that is another way to value it and that's the so that is what we do it in the net present value calculations uh, uh, and grow right so you look at the year year one cash flow okay 500 million year two cash flow okay 300 million year three cash flow okay 400 million you discount everything at what we call the cost of capital rate and that is the net present value and that is the value of the company okay so that's another way to value but there the problem is uh, none of us are really sure about the 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 cash flows of the future yeah because uh, particularly we have revised our business model so we are also may not be very sure of our investment needs and all that kind of a thing so uh, it can be very subjective the cash flow subjective the cash flow so some of the market market people may not accept the cash flow hmm? yeah okay so these are the four methods that you probably will be talking about so that these are the four methods that we are supposed to discuss because these are the four methods that were suggested by the consultant hmm? we are not been asked to give a recommendation so we will just place everything we will place everything and uh, probably we will talk about the share movement of the two companies that was given the great line and the fashion store Yeah, yeah. So you would have seen in the pre-sale the great line, the share prices went steeply up and has come down. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Steadily uh, has gone up, but uh, fashion store has been somewhat very volatile. So uh, depending on the uh, the the model that we apply, whether we are going to apply the 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 great line or the fashion store. it may have different results coming so what it finally tells us is it's very difficult for us to come out with a ideal uh, share issue price or a right basis but on the overall i think the right method for our company is the earnings based model p ratio yeah okay because probably we can get a good uh, good forecast of our earnings and probably we can get a good pe ratio and have can have a range of prices so that you know we can discuss with our investment advisors consultants the merchant banks before we go public so that we can have a idea as to the price even we can give it to the well consultants and get their views also on a real time this is what we should be talking about on the first part of okay that So that is what you are going to talk now. So that's good enough. So what I would like is now, uh, both for what we did in the last paper, last session, and for this session now we are done a half a session. Uh, what I would like is you to think in your own style, own language. Take a word document and write answer. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right answer. Uh, you are in sixty minutes, but you are, don't take sixty minutes because we took little bit of time. Our Because now we have understood the case, so we have read the case. So because of that, uh, don't take sixty minutes. Take about forty-five minutes or fifty minutes and write a good answer. And if you can send me an answer like that, I will be able to give your feedback. Hey, Andrew, I think you should be doing like this. That's a good way to practice it now. Yeah, yeah. sounds good. Yeah, that's a good way to practice it. Now we are going to look at the second issue. Second issue is you remember it is about this governance issue. Hmm? Governance issue. The the but but the the directors are a little bit worried about the governance issue. So on the governance, we have three theories which is very important. So I'm going to put a slide for you uh, just to explain the three theories, uh, the uh, the relationship between the shareholders and the director. 
Hmm? Right. Yeah. Okay. There, are, there are three theories what they talk about. So I'm going to put one slide on the corporate governance which I've done it, but I'm going to take that one slide and talk about to you. So it's about, okay. there are three theories. The one theory what we call stewardship theory. Hmm? Stewardship theory. Stewardship theory is basically the management uh, is viewed as stewards. So the shareholders have given their money to the management or the board of directors and board of directors are supposed to be stewards. Stewards means you must be accountable. Hmm? Yeah. You must be accountable. And, and it all depends on the accountability will depend how much I as a shareholder is interested to know what happened to my mind. The stewardship, now in, in church we have stewards. But the, but the members of the church will ask from the stewards, what did you all do with the money we gave you? Hmm? Yeah, so, yeah. for the stewardship to happen well, but the, the shareholders must take an active interest. So this was one problem with the corporate governance. The, the, one of the issues of the corporate governance was shareholders not taking active interest. They were quite happy to receive a dividend, quite happy to receive an annual report, quite happy just to attend the annual general meeting and that's all. They don't get yeah. involved themselves. But if the stewardship theory is going to work out well, they must get involved. So the board of directors becomes your stewards and your money is given to them and because it is your money that is given, you must take an active interest. Yeah, okay. Yeah. In the other corporate governance theories, what we, so this is what you should be talking about. You must talk about the three theories. The other corporate right. governance theory is what we call the stakeholder theory. They are, the directors take a wider view. Uh, not only the shareholders, the directors have a responsibility to care to too many people in the community. Your employers, the lenders, the environment, the, the banks, uh, the government. So you take a wider view, that we call the stakeholder theory. Yep, okay. Then the third one is the traditional role that we have been mostly talking about, agency theory. Agency theory. Agency theory is basically, you are the shareholder, I am the director, I am your agent. I am your agent. Now normally we think when you are agent, we must act in the best interest of our principal. But actually it is not so. When you are the agent, as the agent, I am more interested about myself. How much agency commission am I going to get? Yeah, yeah. So imagine two of us are giving two real properties for sale to one of the estate agents, real estate agents. He will sell your property if he feels that he can get a bigger commission from selling your property. So as agents, the interest is more of self-interest. These are the problem with the directors. Directors have more of their self-interest than looking after the interests of the principal. Hmm? Yeah, okay. So these are the three corporate governance theories. So uh, we, we have to see where do we, our directors, stand. Right? So, surely as a director, they have a, 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 a kind of a stakeholder theory where they have to be uh, caring for the entire stakeholder. But looking from the shareholder's point of view, as a direct, as directors, if they are particularly going for listing, they must have a clear duty to be fair both by the existing shareholders and by the new shareholder. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, they, the, because you become the directors of all the shareholders. So it's like in an election. Now in the Sri Lanka we had the election. The uh, new president has uh, come into the power, right? But as an elected president, he is the president of both the people who voted for him and the people who did not vote for him. He's the president of the nation. So that was he said yesterday in his uh, interest to the nation. He is the president of the people, some six million people have voted for him, some five million people have not voted for him or voted for the other candidate. 
but he is the president of yeah. the entire nation. And similarly, the board of directors, they must be looking, if you are going for listing, they have to care for the existing shareholders equally as well as for the new shareholders who are going to come up. Hmm? Yes. So, the incoming shareholder. So, from the agency theory point of view, they will be somewhat dictated or somewhat motivated to have a relationship with the new shareholder. The new shareholder. Yeah. Why? Okay. Because their director's future may stand with them now. Hmm? Because the new shareholders will be holding the balance of power. So, because of that, they might take a, some kind of a interest to look after the new shareholders. How can they look after the new shareholders? What can they do as directors to have a little bit of a favor for the new people? What can they do in the share pricing? In the share pricing, what can they do? Imagine you are a director. Because now you know your future will depend on the not on the existing fellows because existing fellows can will be going out or they will be selling some of the shares. It is some new people who are going to take. And you know, if I have to be in power, I must be holding favor with the new people. Yeah? Have a tendency to value the company lower. Oh that's right. Excellent. That's correct. Now this is what I'm trying to get at from you. Right? I will give yeah. you the clue. I want you to open up your mind. The tendency will be to value the shares at a lower price. Value the shares at a lower yeah. price. And that yeah. can... Yeah. yeah, because, because your corporate governance uh, will try to work on that theory, agency theory. And that can have a disappointment on, on the, the shareholder, existing shareholder. Then we have the stewardship theory. Stewardship theory will come up very well here with the money that is available. Lot of money is there inside the company. Hmm? So, so uh, there again, the present shareholders, it was acceptable. For them, it was acceptable to have a little bit of money inside the company, or 200 million inside the company, because, uh, because they could decide on the dividend policy and they were quite happy to keep that 200 million. But the new people yeah. who are going to come, right, the new people who are going to come will not like having too much of money inside no. the company. Because, because as the stake, as the stewardship, I would like you to invest my money in right activities to give me a better, better thing. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, that, that can, uh, that can, uh, make a difference in your share price. Now, if you try to return the money to the existing shareholders before you go to the market, uh, that may give some kind of an indication that uh, you are uh, returning the money because you don't have any new projects to invest yeah, the money. Yeah. And that can have a very negative impact on your share pricing. Right? Uh, uh, yeah, it, it can give the impression that you don't know, know that we don't have any clear idea about future growth. So if that is the case, your share prices will drop and the people may not want to buy the share. Because they'll think that if there's no money to invest then it's likely to be a start. Yeah, yeah. On the <coughs> you're right. On the other hand, you might invest all the money today on certain projects, probably not the best of the projects, but you might decide keeping cash is not good enough. We must invest all the on the money on the project. And that what happens is if that is done, uh, because uh, if you invest in a project, it is not going to bring you the returns today, tomorrow. It is going to take some time. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Some time. And during that some time, you don't have money and, uh, and uh, you have already invested the uh, money. And, and because of that, there may be a tendency for even for your share price to come down further. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah. Unless you can convince and say that yeah, it's going to improve it in five years' time, because uh, people will see you have no money, it is already invested, but your present earnings doesn't justify 
that kind of capital. Yes. Yeah. So that can be another problem, that can be a corporate governance issue that is going to come up. And the directors, all these directors, if you really look at, most of the people have been either, they have been either internally inside the company or they have come from outside and mostly you can see they are private sector people. Private sector people, yeah. if you really look at the director, you will see their profile. Almost all of them have the private sector uh, the profile. So, uh, managing a private sector company and a public sector company are going to be totally, totally different uh, structures. So, you might have certain corporate governance uh, issues arising from that one. Yes, yeah. yeah. okay. Of, because all your directors have been there, yeah, the people, uh, the Judy Tosa came from uh, some company and that, uh, yeah, Arthur Brown is, uh, is the only non-executive director, right? Then uh, Brenda is, uh, had senior positions in the retailers, uh, but uh, she, she, but she, because she is a non-executive in some cable vision, a quoted internet service provider. Uh, Chance is your marketing man. Uh, he has been working as a senior sales manager, so he's also more of internal man. Then uh, Dana Elliott is the chief financial officer, a career in a government department and uh, including manufacturing company, and uh, she's an unexecuted in opera company, right? So then uh, this our human resources man is also a, a person who has been having some international experience. But they don't seem to be having too much of public sector, public listed company thing. Okay. Right. So they may not have all the relevant experience, and uh, and maybe you will. Learn. And of course, public, obviously, when you go public, one thing you have to understand is you need to have non-executive. Right. As a as a private company, you don't need to have non-executive director. But at the moment, they have one non-executive director, the chairman. Uh, that is that Arthur, right? So they may have to they may have to go for more new non-executive director, and also okay. probably probably they have to go for additional executive directors with listed company experience because none of them has, has seems to be having experience on that area. So you may want to go with a with a with a non uh, non executive person kind of a person so the corporate governance terms will dictate a change in the directory probably arthur brown can continue to be the chairman of the yeah. company because he is coming with an executive experience so with his banking experience uh, we can so what I'm trying to tell you is, this is the way that you should be looking in a scenario, in a question. You would have seen the things that we saw today. Hmm? Nothing, yeah, yeah. nothing to take it up from a particular textbook as such, just to, just to brush up your knowledge, of course, on the valuation method, that's a different story. But uh, most likely, you're going to write in very, very general terms, with what you have already learned. There was nothing for you to newly learn it. But I think what we discussed today basically would have widened up your mind how to answer this related scenario case. Yeah, definitely. definitely yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I can see, what I can see is you need very little from the pre-seed. Pre-seed will add a little bit of a, a topping for the question I will answer. Right? Like, like looking at this uh, board of directors and all that. But what you really require is to look at the unseen, look at what this task is and go for the task and put it up. If you can do yeah. that one, I think you are going to do very well. So this is, uh, this is what you should be looking at. So uh, one thing is I can see this question coming up. Uh, we don't have the pre-scene yet, but the pre-scene for the management case study is out and it's all about a construction company. Right, okay. A project company. So there I can see a lot of questions because that is at a different level, that is at a managerial level, asking you about the 
the accounting standard on the construction or they might not ask you the accounting standard, they'll ask you the accounting treatment. But you are supposed to talk about the accounting standard and all. Now here, they would I say in your technical marks, would I come from those valuation methods? Asset base, yeah. earnings base, the, the dividend growth model and the, and the cash flow method. So you have to talk about the advantages, disadvantages of each of the methods. And your, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and your communication skills are basically uh, how you are going to put it up because you are simply putting up all your thoughts to your CEO duty. Mm -hmm. Leader, yeah. Leadership skills is uh, you are not going to get influenced by that report. You are going to put up your own things and say, look here, net asset valuation is totally out for us. Right? We, right. Should, we, okay. we should not talk about net asset valuation because... Uh, we are a going concern, we are a successful company and uh, you know, we are doing so well and we are going to do better because we have changed our strategies and the, uh, the, even the present earnings is not a, uh, not a uh, comparison for what we are going to earn. So uh, the present company is also may not be a comparison for what we are going to do like that, you know, we have to give that uh, confidence and talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and your business skill is, you should not be you know, you should not get overcarried by your knowledge or whatever. You must be very balanced minded. Balanced minded. And you should be able to say, uh, you know, yes, true enough. Uh, net asset valuation is not good. Earnings is okay. But earnings, we may have a problem because the people may not accept our earnings because they have not seen our earnings yet. So we have to convince with our earnings that kind of a, a thing you should be speaking to do this. Because Judith must be fully armed when she goes before the board meeting. And on the corporate and on the corporate governance, you will be talking about the stewardship theory, the stakeholder theory, and the agency theory, and say how this new share price can get affected by either one of the theories, and also your excess cash and all that kind of a thing. And on the from the corporate governance point of view, what are the changes that will come? One thing is the remuneration, right? So you have to have committees now. All this time the directors themselves would have been fixing their salaries or maybe with the 40 shareholders they have agreed. But now they have to have committees. Audit committee, the remuneration committee, the nomination committee, the disclosures. And also it's not a very uh, easy thing because already maybe in section one we have discussed it. Listing is a very costly, expensive one. You need a lot of advice, expert, all that. Transparency, corporate governance, having more non-executive data, it's an expensive process. So we have to uh, we have to weigh those things. But anyway, now I think we have weighed all that, we have decided, but we are telling Jody, look here, these are the implications of this listing on the corporate governance. Yeah, yeah. So you have, you'll be specifically talking about the remuneration committee, specifically talking about the audit committee, and even the risk management. Right, because here the present thing, you know, it can be a very informal thing. But everything will have to be formal when we go for listing. And that is what the corporate governance is going to mean. And what is corporate governance? It's a system by which the companies are directed at control. And it's all about the it's all about the the board of directors role. And you may want to talk something about the UK model, maybe the South African model, all that kind of a thing, because the stakeholder theory is more on the South African model the King's Report. So like that, you will be talking. Whatever you know, you will be talking within the time limit. So what I thought, yeah. what I thought was in this area, probably 30 minutes, 30 minutes equal time, I will split it up at the beginning. But having done the first section with 30 minutes, second section I go, if I have enough to write on 30 minutes, I will write it. But if I don't have enough to write on 30 minutes, I will write it for 15 minutes, come back and add up another 15 minutes to the first section. Yeah, yeah. So because uh, I don't see in the paper they give any time indicator for the task one, task two. So we may have to uh, do it on our balancing act and decide. And you know, right. okay. maybe sometimes I will think, no, I think uh, this Judy's first thing is more important. I may think that Judy's second thing is more important. So I can divide my time accordingly. Right. So that's basically what we have to do it. Any questions that you have? 
No, I don't. I don't think so. No. No. I th I th to be honest, I think you're going through everything very well. Um, it's all. It's all starting to make a lot more sense, really, about what what might come up and what might be expected. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, now I think even I, for me also, as I start discussing only, it is really coming up. When I try to think about myself, it's not coming up. But when I try to discuss, things can come up because we are, we are moving into the real world now. And this is what exactly yeah. that should happen in this uh, thing. Otherwise, when I see these papers and papers, uh, I don't get that, uh, uh, that uh, catalyst or the incentive we want to do it. But when I talk to you, when I talk to the other students, I'm getting a lot of points into my head. So this is exactly what should be happening. So what we are going right. to look at is, yeah, I think uh, we have a session on Friday again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good with me. Yeah. yeah, same time. Yeah, Friday same time we will meet, we will look at the third part of this question also. Right, okay. And okay. then, and then, till the precinct comes, maybe the precinct will come by that time next week, but uh, even if the precinct comes, I want to keep a little bit of time to study the precinct. I just don't want to waste my precinct. But what we are going to do is, we are going to look at some uh, separate questions, like what we saw the valuation method, for example. So like that, yeah. from our uh, uh, experience, we can look at certain sections, the technical sections, uh, and we can look at a you know, particular scenario and how to answer. So let's look at a few couple of questions till we move into the the precinct. Okay, perfect. Right. You are going to sit for this exam in March, no? Yes. Right, okay. So that's good. So no problem. We are, so now, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I will tell you is now, for the two sections, you know, maybe you may not have time to do everything before Friday, but try and do, sit for 60 minutes on your computer, do the section yeah. one. Section one. But I don't want to take 60 minutes, I want to take you 45 minutes. Because already we yeah, you, yeah. you know the model. So because of that, that reading time must keep the way. Take a word document, write answer. Right? Don't worry okay. too much about everything, but as if you are writing to Judy. With your subheadings, bold headings, all that kind of thing. In the, in the computer screen, you will have all that. The subheadings, yeah. the bold headings, the italics, the, you know, all that is there. So just like you are writing to Judy, write a report. So then, then only okay. we will really see, well, you know, how we are going to spend that 45 minutes on a, on a, on a uh, constant basis. So for the first two sections, try and read it, write it, and the third section also we will do it Friday, and then we will be able to be in a better position. Okay. Right. So I'll see you on Friday, same time, on the, uh, the third section. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Right, okay. Thanks, uh, Andrew. Take care. Uh, and you. Speak to you soon. Yeah, bye. 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 I'll send you the link for this recording also. Okay, brilliant. Thank yeah. you. Right, okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.